You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Hello and welcome to Creep Geeks Podcast. This is Season 6, Episode 237. New military technology causing increased paranormal belief and conspiratorial thinking? Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome back to the Creepies Podcast. If this is your very first time listening, we're glad to have you here. And if you are a repeat offender, uh, welcome back. Yeah. So we got a lot of stuff to talk about in this particular podcast. And this is all uh, sort of brought about by, you know, that general uneasy feeling we're all getting. Oh. Yeah. General uneasy feeling. Yeah. Because when I get that feeling, <laughs> right, okay. I need uneasy healing. So like I was going to make a meme recently because I was thinking about like just some of the news we're going to talk about now and then some stuff I've been seeing on TV and social media as well as I have a trigger and that trigger. Yeah, trigger. It, yes. So every time things get really weird in the universe or on this whole planet, um, there's a certain song that gets really prevalent and it just comes back and becomes more popular and it's uh, Where Is My Mind by the Pixies. Yeah. And it's on all these commercials now. It's on some TikToks and I just That's keep it. hearing it and I'm like, is this it? That's it. <laughs> yep. So we got a bunch of weird stuff going on. It's a bunch of weird stuff to talk about and it becomes the time of year where things just get a little, little weird. I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It seems like, you know, Things sort of fade off and relax and sort of pick back up again when it comes to like paranormal, weird, and spooky stuff. But this is not the case. And I think it's it's pressure. Looming threat. Is it? No, I don't know. Or is it like a ridiculous form of cabin fever? I think what it is is neither of those. I think okay. it's just that once you spend some time looking at something, then you start to see more things that are related to and are maybe similar to the thing that you're looking at. You're like, What? It's like, go out there and look for, like, purple cars. You know, you never notice them, but then one time you see one, you're like, I'm going to keep looking for purple cars. You'll start seeing a bunch of purple cars. Yeah, but isn't that, like, a phenomenon? Like, once you see this one thing, and then you, you're you going to put your own brain in the mindset to look for that thing? Well, yeah, I mean, if you become fixated on it, sure. Okay. So, anyway, this is just something that, you know, has been put out. There. Anyway, okay, so let's do this. <laughs> <clears throat> In this particular podcast, we have a lot of things that we're going to talk about that may or may not be related to whatever. I, I don't. I don't really know. Okay, so have you, have you ever had the feeling when you start eyeballing stuff that, like, wait a minute, maybe these things are connected? Yes. Maybe it's a silver strand that's starting to connect, and then you sit there and you know it reminds me of the meme where you've got. I think it's Charlie from. Uh, Always sunny. Yeah, where he's got like his arms up and the, there's the crazy like sort of connected board behind him with all these like newspaper articles and stuff all connected with yarn and junk like that. And desk hair because he's falling asleep at his yeah. desk researching. And he's yeah. all nutty. That's kind of where I'm getting with this. Like, and I started looking at this the other day and I'm like, hmm, wait a minute. But it is what it is. And we'll see if it actually comes to fruition because I think the idea, because people are like, what is, what, is, what is this guy talking about, right? What are they talking about? They haven't said anything. The idea of UFO disclosure and people seeing more UFO things and just in general being more aware of the paranormal, I, th I think a lot of it is directly related to two things. Okay. New military technology. Yes. I mean, recent in the past, like 20 years, 30 years or so, at the most, right? And lazy conspiratorial thinking. Okay, so you've got me on that one, because now I'm like... Yes. Hmm. Well, it gets better, right? <laughs> oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'll take a deep breath. Yeah. Okay, so this particular podcast episode is brought to you by our patrons that we have out there, and uh, we would take a second to say thank you very much, patrons, including some of the new patrons that we have. Yeah. Right? So big thanks to Dave, John, James, Isis, John, Bobby, Phil, and Mark. Very nice. Yeah. 
Now, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, go ahead and check the link in the show notes for this podcast episode. Everything we talk about or mention on the show, you can find links to in the show notes for each episode we put out. Oh, you better be careful. Oh. Because you know, with some latest paranormal drama that's out there, if you try to support yourself or get a little bit of support to continue doing what you like to do, people get mad at you. I'm thanking people, <laughs> not begging people. No, I know, but there's people out there that want to throw shade. When they're doing exactly the same thing, maybe at a minor level. This is kind of one of those, uh, well, what do you call it, in your endos? In, in you, what do we say? In your, uh, I lift up people who produce good content, which means, as far as this podcast is concerned, I support mediocre content. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are, we're thriving on mediocrity here. You guys are graced We with appreciate <laughs> most of the attention that you give us. We're not asking for all of it, right? Yeah. But no, it just seems to be one of those things where every so often it kicks up that if you're trying to support yourself or if you're putting something out there and, and maybe you have a YouTube channel or maybe you have a way of social media is, is kicking you some bones, right, to kind of keep doing what you're doing, there's other people who say, oh, I would never do that. And those people are like, you know, I can't believe that you would have a YouTube channel or I can't believe that you're an Amazon influencer or you can't believe, you know. And those people are consumers. They consume your content. I just spent three days teaching multiple nonprofits and profit for good companies that supporting yourself through other avenues like digital storytelling is an acceptable way to earn additional funds to support your cause. No way. Yes, I did. Because let's all take a second and realize it's 2022. The internet is a thing. YouTube is a thing. Instagram is a thing. All these social media platforms and social influencers out there, like them or not, um, are providing a service and you know, not, not all, you don't have to like them all and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's real. And the people that complain the most about it, that are like, you should be doing this for free out of the kindness of your heart are the ones that don't particularly produce any content at all. And in the paranormal community, if you have a content creator and they produce good work or work that many people like, they are considered community ambassadors. When people look inward towards your community, which in this case would be paranormal or cryptid or what yeah. have you. So those are the people that if they produce the content, people like the content, lift them up. Yes. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not, you know, and you know, some people will say that there is something wrong with that. And to those people, I say, ha ha, no. Now, if you feel Disagreed. that you are one of those people that should be lifted up or you have a uh, completely different opinion you should give us a call that phone number is going to be 575-208-4025 or contact at creepgeeks.com yes won't cost you anything at all except for your time yeah Yeah. i mean that was a weird tangent but you know hey it is what it is so here's the scoop uh the other day um as we do and you're off teaching people how to do social media stuff and photography and photography right and some other stuff like that uh i I was doing my thing, which basically you was sitting there going, you know, podcast, we got to do a podcast and everybody's talking about the same thing because everything is all related. And what I had noticed was, is that everything is all related. And then I came across a theory that we have said multiple times, and I don't know if you agree 100% with it and it's okay. You don't have to. Okay. Because I suppose the, the, pun, the fun of it is, is because I'll say something and you'll look at me like I'm nuts and want to fight about it. And I'm like, <laughs> bring it on. Okay. And just as a little trick, you know, a little side note, I turn the ceiling fan off so it gets all hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, you want some of this? Because that way you get all aggravated. And I get aggravated because of the heat. Like, I'll show you. <laughs> and oh. just as for more... Uh, How much sugar did you have in your uh, Creep Geeks Bigfoot blend coffee today? A lot? <laughs> First off, how dare you? But yeah, pretty much, man. I'm just like, so you're all wound up right now. I'm all sugared up. Okay. It's all caffeine. It's late. We've been arguing about, well, not really arguing about, we've been heatedly discussing the merits of stuff I can't remember now. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So let's do this. Here's the deal. You, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to the, we've had, Semi-disclosure. And by semi-disclosure, I mean there's been lots of news that's come out since like 2016 is when it really started, right? With the um, AA tip and, you know, the whole, let's call them, unexpl- it was an, un- I can't even talk about it now. 
unexplained aerial phenomenon instead of UFOs. Yeah. And then the whole disclosure is going to happen in 180 days, and it didn't happen. We're going to release all these documents, and everybody's just all into it, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of investigators and stuff. And, and, and during all of that, we've all been sort of locked down, and people have been paying more attention and seeing more things and all this, and, and it's just like, it's all UFOs, man. Alien and UFOs. And a lot of people are super excited about that. And and that's fine. But it's not. It's not. Yeah. I'm not saying everything up in the sky that you see, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not putting a blanket statement. 100% of everything that's out there that you can't explain is military. But a good 85% of it's military. I'm starting to think, okay, because I'm a skeptic on that. Because I just don't have that much faith in humanity, so I'm thinking closer to 50 to 60%. Well, you don't have that much faith in the military. No. Mil- <laughs> you human want, scientific advancement. You want some of this? <laughs> <laughs> I do not have that much faith in human scientific advancement right now. So when it comes to this, I'm starting to think maybe 50, 60% up there is either military or private company because uh you know, maybe there's some sort of private company that has a contract that is either scientific or military intelligence. And well, there's tons, tons of contractors out there. And then I'm starting to think 10% is just purely unexplained, and then the other 30% might actually be UFOs. So, well, that's that's very um, Diplom- magnanimous of you. Diplomatic. It's not diplomatic. I mean, okay, it's completely However, fine. I will say. Out of the eight reports Creep Geeks podcast has had, well, I, me of Creep Geeks has had regarding stuff in the sky here locally, nearly all of them have been Starlink. So. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's okay, because if you've never seen Starlink in the sky, it is, it is a thing. And when you look at it, you're like, whoa. Yeah. But, you know, kind of is what it is. And, and that kind of gets to what I'm talking about here is that, you know, there's been some some things that have been occurring, and this has not been just in the past year or two, but, you know, go, go, let's just go back to 2016, right? I think that a lot of what we're seeing now is is basically the verge of a different type of disclosure. Hmm. And this disclosure is, is our, you know, is an unpopular uh, paranormal thought. I was going to say our, but <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't know if you want to be lumped into this category just yet. Okay. So UFO disclosure from government, right, from the government, will release information about our own military advancements in technology, and I think it's already started. Hmm. So let's do disclosure, and let's also use disclosure as a means to sort of, you know, have our military technology that's currently out and about be less the focal point than it needs to be. In other words, there's things that are occurring, and I think a lot of our military technology that's that's sort of uh, becoming more and more out there, and maybe it's being seen, maybe it's become more of an obvious thing. If you want to kind of like take some of the heat off of it, Mm -hmm. now's the time. It's a perfect diversionary tactic, right? You got a bunch of weird stuff going on. You're doing some thorough testing with your military technology before you take it to a... A, a more you know ready to use sort of let's put it in the in the uh, arsenal of stuff that we have. Now's the best time to do that because everybody's reporting seeing stuff, and we've got you know reports from the military of unidentified aerial phenomena flying around that we just can't put a finger on. We don't know what's going on. We don't we don't know where it's from or how it's doing it. Now's the best time. It's like a diversionary tactic. Yeah, and I'm sitting here racking my brain about the different types of um, distraction methods diversionary yeah it, like so you're saying that right now the government is using the current disclosure news or the popularity of the idea of disclosure and pulling on arguments and attitudes from a few years ago in order to accomplish stuff now actually in order to take some of the scrutiny off of what's already happening so it, it's it's like Project Blue Book, right? Where people are like, we're going to investigate that. And they went out and then they investigated sightings and things like that, right? So under the While guise, they were still occurring. Under the guise of, oh, yes, we acknowledge there's unidentified stuff out there. Under that guise, they're going to proceed with their military testing and technology. 
Yeah, because I, I think a good chunk of what people are actually seeing is military technology. Okay. And what better way to do it than, like we've said in the past, when the military is like, ooh, I don't know what that is. What do you think it is? I'm not sure. And you're like, oh, what is it? And then people are going to gravitate towards the easiest explanation, which is it's it's got to be UFO. It's foreign. You know, it's 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 for I don't know anything like that. So whatever has already been ingrained in culture and society for the past four or decades, maybe. Well, that with a little bit of help okay. from like shows and things like that. And the whole idea of aliens, UFOs, monsters, paranormal stuff is all way become uh, more palatable and more mainstream than it ever has before. Modern folklore. Right, because you lock people up for a while, they get a little crazy, and things become more normal. You know, like building a racetrack that runs out of your window of your upstairs bedroom all the way around your backyard three or four times and comes back into the house, Mm -hmm. and then filming that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That sounds awesome. That's a great idea. If you did that during any other time, people like, that guy's a nut job. Stay away from him. Yeah, because didn't, God, there are so many of those TikToks. Exactly. There was a YouTube yeah. YouTube and a TikTok channel where a guy did exactly that, and he put a camera on it. Whole pandemic. Yeah, making money. Yeah. Just because, and it's like, wow, that's an ingenious thing to do while you're locked up and you can't do much. Yeah. But if you if the world's a oyster and everything's wide open, people are like, what are you doing, man? Well, you know, why are you putting a racetrack, you know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> so let's look at this. So... There's been patents by the U.S. military, and I'm talking about the Navy, right? The U.S. Navy for alternative propulsion types. It started in 2016. And if you look at the patent information, some of those images look like the triangle craft that people have been talking about and seeing. Mm -hmm. And some of them look like diamonds, like the diamond craft that people talk about and have been seeing. Right? And there's we have a link to everything we talk about in the show notes. And this link will take you to Google Google, Google (laughs) patents, right, where it talks about You know, the U.S. Navy wanting to patent this inertial mass reduction device. Which is a type of, you know, propulsion. I'm trying to read the abstract so I can catch up. And then, you know, and we knew this was coming out because this has already been out. And, like, what are they doing with all that sort of thing? Well, there's a link that actually takes you to the Navy finally speaks up about its bizarre UFO patent experiments. I mean, is this a diversionary tactic or... Maybe the military has already created triangle craft. Now, whether they come from their own minds or have been influenced or basically ideas taken from crashed UFO craft or something like that, you know, reverse engineered alien technology, who knows? Yeah. But it's there. They're trying to patent it. And this is not a recent thing. It's 2016. That's six years ago. And so... Their patents got approved. That's how we knew about it. They put in for the patent in 2016. I think the patent got approved in 2018. So that's, that's kind of odd, right? Hey, let's patent UFO propulsion style technology and put diagrams of what look like triangle craft. Huh. Doesn't that look like the standard black triangle that you've seen in freaking X-Files since 1992? It reminds me of like the Time Life Paranormal series and how they had the, <laughs> they had some photos, <coughs> like <laughs> alleged photos, you know? And those like, hey, this the- is the hapless diamond shape coming through the atmosphere yeah. and the sonic booms that you hear. But yeah. You know, it, okay, so it says a craft using an inertial mass reduction device comprises of an inner resonant cavity wall, an outer resonant cavity, and microwave emitters. Electrically charged outer resonant cavity wall and the electrically insul- insulated inner resonant, uh, resonant cavity wall form a resonant cavity. What the hell does that mean? I don't know, right? The microwave emitters create high-frequency electromagnetic waves throughout the resonant cavity, causing the resonant cavity to vibrate in an accelerated mode and create a local polarized vacuum outside the outer resonant cavity wall. I don't know what that means exactly, but if you think about the AA tip or the A-tip stuff where you see the craft kind of flying, and like, it almost looks kind of like a little diamond or whatever, flying at the angle really fast and has that sort of weird black shadow around the outside. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Maybe that disturbance is exactly what we're looking at here. And if that be the case, if you're displacing gravity by reducing the mass using microwave emitters, then I think G-forces don't have the same effect. So you can fly around super fast, go from zero to you know a 1,000 miles an hour in half a second. And all of that stuff. It's like flying in a force field. Yes. With magnetism and microwaves. Microwaves. Um, magnetism actually, is part yeah. of it. I'm trying to like actually like. Learn. Comprehend 
yeah, I don't know why I'm bothering to. I mean, <laughs> well, no, I mean, if you sit there and you spend some time and you actually look at it, it makes sense because they actually do a background when they talk about, um, you know, forces, weak nuclear forces, electromagnetic forces, gravitational force, and the hierarchy. In other words, how they sort of work together. And if you can manipulate those in a certain way, the static electric charge that comes off and can be a combination with some other things can actually effectively create levitation. This has its own classification, well, not its own, but it has a classification as unconventional spacecraft compulsion, propulsion systems. And it's got this long government type number, which makes me go, oh, apparently unconventional spacecraft propulsion systems, people have been filing patents and classifications for quite a while. So Yeah, well, you don't really t- particularly hear about them unless you know to go look for them. But yeah. at the same time, with Google patents out there, uh, we know that this was assigned by the Department of the Navy or to the mm-hmm. Department of the Navy. It's actually patent number in uh, 2016. So April 28, 2016, and the application was granted December 4th, 2018, and then was basically published the same December 4th, 2018. Which is funny because this uh, article that you shared from um, The Drive with the, uh, I get Brett Tingley did it. He does mention that this high energy electromagnetic field generator testing occurred from October 2016 through de- September 2019. Yes. So while that we this, know about it. Yeah. So while this patent was in process, I guess, they were already doing the testing. Yeah. Huh. I would think they've probably been doing the testing since before stealth technology came out. And people were seeing flying triangles. Hmm. So, all right. That's kind of weird, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just joking on my own spit. All right. So you've got the Navy makes basically doing the UFO patents, right? And let's talk about this too, because it's all sort of related. We'll tie us all together a little bow. Directed energy weapons and EMP weapons. Relatively new technology, right? Now let's look at most recent events that you have at it can possibly be tied to it. All right. So there was a mass of birds that just fell out of the sky in New Mexico. And there's video of it. It's pretty, pretty crazy video. Right? And when the was that? Birds. 2020? 2021. 2021. Recent. It was recent video, right? Came out of Mexico. Shows all these birds whizzing around flying in a, like a, like a swarm, kind of a, you know, they kind of flow together and they fly, you know, flock. Yeah. But it's more like a swarm. It's like a, like a thousand birds all flying together and they go through the air and they, you know, you know what I'm talking about? A it's like a little migration. tiny bird. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, anyway, kind of like that. And just magically, like like flipping a light switch, half of it hit the ground. It's like it just turned off. Oh. So, I mean, it is what it is. We all know birds aren't real. Hey. So that's the thing, right? <laughs> what they actually talk about, you know, hey, what caused this? And so some scientists got together and said they think they know why hundreds of birds mysteriously just fell from the sky in Mexico. They say, and I'll put it in a nutshell for you, because we have a lot of links that are included in this particular episode, that it's a predator response. Somebody got freaked out, thought it was a hawk, and since they fly together like that, like in formation, yeah, that they just made a mistake and they all flew into the ground. And I've watched the video, and we have a link to the video that's in there, and I'm like, that's not what happened at all. It looks to me like they were flying in formation, kind of like doing their thing as they're flying like the swallows and sparrows do. Yeah. And I think they got zapped, and they dropped out of the sky. So we had the New Mexico one in 2021. Well, I was going to say, the same event occurred in New Mexico in 2021. And then this one. And now there was another one. Oh, wow. Wales, El Paso, Texas. Right. Uh, Wow. Okay. Now, having had my own military experience and know a little bit about radars and stuff like that, as in stay away from them, Mm -hmm. right? Um, we used to have birds that would fly by and get zapped all the time and just fall to the deck because they fly through this, you know, it's radiated energy. It's microwave energy. Radar is basically microwaves. And it, it kind of like zaps them. And it doesn't turn them into like a puff of smoke or anything. They just fall. They're just dead. Aww. That's it. Yeah. And to me, when I seen that, I'm like, I mean, what could actually cause that? They think they see a hawk, so a hundred of them just automatically fly into the ground. That's kind of dumb. Why wouldn't they go left, right, or up? Or you know, it just makes sense, right? Because birds have their own way of evading things mm-hmm. when predator response is necessary. It's like they got zapped right out of the sky. So I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. That'd be more like a directed energy weapon. You can take a radar that's designed to track planes and start pointing pointing it at people, and you're going to cause them physiological problems. And it's funny you say directed energy weapons because the 2020 thousands of birds 
dying or mysteriously dead in New Mexico, because it was 2020 in New Mexico. Yeah. Um, the explanation for those ones dropping out of the sky were the wildfires in California. And what did we have a theory about regarding the wildfires in California? I think that there's some precedent to be held for the whole directed energy weapon thing, because, I mean, you can create a wildfire that strategically burns things in a neighborhood. Yeah. You see fires all-encompassing, but you know what's not? Uh, you know, uh, an energy weapon that's designed to basically take something out. I mean, there's a reason why it is what it is when it comes to these surgical strike and all that sort of thing. You know, that, that sort of information – you know, that gets put out there about warfare, and you say a, surgi- a surgical strike was conducted was to reduce human casualty and property damage. Just, you know, you can't just, just start bombing everything because that's uncool, right? Yeah. And you can't just say, oh, there's my target. Let me decimate the entire town. You want to blow up the house the target's in. Mm-hmm. That's why they create special weapons that are capable of doing it, the guidance systems and tracking ability to actually conduct a very precise operation like Tomahawk, Missiles flying down the street during a Gulf War and Desert Storm and all that to hit their targets instead of just blowing up an entire city block. Which is part of the reason why those missiles cost so much money. You know, if you just want to lob a bomb at somebody and blow everything up, that's a whole lot less expensive than a missile that can fly down the street using GPS and navigate to the one building you want to hit and not take out all the rest of the buildings. Mm. You want to minimize economic loss, you know, property damage and destruction, and, of course, the big one, people. You want to eliminate unnecessary casualties that shouldn't be, you know, there in the first place. It shouldn't be, you know, that sort of thing. So so I'm looking at that and going, okay, so that's kind of weird, right? And we're talking about the alien thing and the UFO thing and just these weird sightings in the sky, and I do think a lot of this is technology. So we've got patents for military, as in the U.S. Navy, triangle-shaped devices, alternative forms of UFO propulsion, We've got this whole directed energy weapon thing, which could be, okay. because the explanations of why these thousands of birds just fall out of the sky don't make any sense to me. The California wildfires that we didn't include in the links, you know, that was pretty kind of crazy. This article actually brought it up. I was like, wait a second. So, yeah. And it's like, and then, so what's the latest to add on top of that? It would be the hypersonic weapons that we're talking about now. <laughs> Right, so hypersonic weapons, when we're talking about like some of these hypersonic missiles that basically China and I think Korea and even Russia says that they have, where they can fly at hypersonic speeds about six times faster than the speed of sound and strike a country, that's pretty scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it, you know, hey, if you launch a regular cruise missile or ICBM, maybe it takes 10, 15 minutes to get to you. I mean, that's, that's still pretty scary. But what if you can get there six times faster, probably be less expensive and be just as lethal? Okay. That's a, that's a missile you could fire from Korea and hit, like, California or anywhere you want. That's what the Koreans are saying, the North Koreans, right? Mm-hmm. It's just hypersonic whip. So, in New Mexico, there's been, and this is something that we're going to talk about because it's a little bit more um, more information involved or available to look at. In New Mexico, there's been these things that we're going to call LBEs. Mm-hmm. LBE is loud boom effect. Okay. Okay. Now, there's been loud booms reported all over the world and all over the U.S. for a very long time. So it's not like a new thing. But, however, in New Mexico, they've been happening quite frequently to the point where people are becoming more aware of them. Yes. And not just letting them slide and and just say, well, that's just what it is, but actually doing some kind of, like, research. And this is what I like about it. Um, Because these people are basically doing research to counter one of the articles that we put in this podcast to talk about, which is the lazy paranormal thinking. They're coming together and they're providing their knowledge and expertise to debunk each other and at the same time to forward the theory of what it may be. So we actually have a link to a Reddit of all things thread to kind of take a look at. And the reason why I put it in here is because I'm like, okay, these comments are gold. Okay. And the comments are gold in a way that's like, uh, wow, there's some smart people here. Yes. And I'm not saying that to be slight, slighted towards anybody in particular or any, you know, any one you know, place in particular, but there, there was some pretty smart, um, you know, individuals. So, okay. And I'm, I'm trying to find the link because, of course, I, I put the link to the video because there is a video and the video is important because the video actually shows a large flash of light and the explosion that occurs, right? Because that's what people are complaining or talking about is that it's loud boom, right? They hear a loud boom. Yeah. Some people hear a loud boom. Those people are further away. 
the people that hear a loud explosion are closer to what it is that's causing this LBE, <gasps> loud boom effect. Oh, wow. Can you see the video? Yeah. So we have a link to the video that you can watch. If you go to our website, creepgeeks.com, you can kind of click on it. It'll take you to Reddit. It shows you the video. Uh, but if you want to read the comments, you probably have to go back into Reddit and look at the actual thread. You can do that by clicking on the title. Yeah. Because Reddit's weird like that. Now, if you've never been in Reddit, you know, if you want to comment, just be warned, man. This is, uh, people don't mess around with Reddit. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just really appreciate the fact that this is on Reddit because it kind of reaffirms my different opinions of different social no, media platforms. No, people will tell you straight up your yeah. junk. You know, they don't, they don't put up with that kind of stuff. So Yeah, but in this case, I, I like the cooperation th- between everybody in yeah. all places. And they seem Albuquerque. to be, yeah, New Mexico, right? And yeah. they seem to be very nice about, um, uh, you know. Not really blasting. Reddit can be pretty cutthroat, actually, and they seem to be pretty nice about not necessarily blasting uh, people with stupid opinions. Yeah. As in it doesn't pertain at all to what they're trying to talk about, right? But this explosion, it's like a, oh. Yeah, and the cool thing was is the guy has four different camera views, and they occur at slightly different times, so you could actually triangulate the distance and time and all that sort of thing. But one of the things that's talked about with this explosion, and this is where it gets slightly different than the other loud booms people have heard around the world and across the U.S., is that you can actually hear a whoosh or feel pressure, like whoosh, like whizzing past them, and then the boom, like a sonic boom. And you can see the the, the boom effect after the flash on the trees. Yeah. In uh, one of the preview panes or video panes that he has up on his screen, you see the flash and you can almost count a second before the trees shake. Yeah. It's like a sonic boom. Yeah. And it's like a localized sonic boom because it occurs in a certain place in New Mexico. It doesn't deviate too far. In other words, the most intensive part of the, atom- of the atomic, of the La Boom effect actually occurs in, in a regional specific spot. It doesn't like happen like, you know, in downtown Albuquerque and the next is out in like Rio Rancho of 20 miles away kind of a thing. It's like it happens around the same area when it occurs. If you read the comment thread, um, thank you for thank you so much for your post on this. I've been hearing these explosions for months, and I thought I was losing it because I couldn't find anything on the news or online. And then people are like, uh, "This has been going on for longer than this. I've heard this for over a year now." And they start talking about locations, like uh, where they live. Like I live around San Pedro and Montgomery, and it was exactly west of me. I'm by Del Norte was this morning around 5.45 a.m. Right. Yes, 5.51 a.m. Yes. Remember when you used to wake up way too early and then you'd spend the next few hours anxious? Yes. Yeah. Was this going on back then? Because we'd both wake up. Well, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know. Yeah. But see, here's what gets kind of crazy, right? So they talk about the cameras and the video, right? And people appreciate the video. And they also talk about, you know, some of the things that are going on in the video. But here's something that's pretty cool. Uh, five, this other person has camera footage as well. It says 549 and 39 seconds on mine, but our time stamps are way too far apart to be accurate. So I don't think we'll be able to triangulate based on them. And there's an edit to it. Actually could be right. The speed of sound at 0.213 miles per second and 17 seconds difference would be 5.3 miles, which is about how far I am away from where you said. These people are triangulating based off of, you know, the the time that they have on their cameras to determine distance and speed. This is New Mexico, man. Yeah. And, you know, what's funny because a lot of the conversation you have in this particular thread, which is our Albuquerque is like, where's the best place to eat and things like that. And it's like, this is some science junk. And it should be noted that you have things like Sandia Labs, as in Sandia National Laboratory. You've got Roswell's there. You've got like some some national secret, top secret stuff mm-hmm. that occurs in and around New Mexico. So it doesn't surprise me that there's smart people there. And this guy's like, hey, now that we've confirmed that our time stamps are accurate enough for tri- triangulation, here's three time stamps in this thread. You guys need to DM me. So you can give me more accurate locations without doxing yourselves and come back to let us know what's happening. I have a TDOA triangulation script ready to go, and I'll <laughs> message those people who posted timestamps uh, to see if they'll give me the location. So you got people writing scripts to determine this sort of thing, right? Yeah. And so it's like, oh, it should be three miles and change for 17 seconds. Maybe you transpo- In other words, correcting their work as they've gone along. 
so you've got people putting information out there, people running calculations and equations for it, people correcting and, and, and basically verifying the information is correct. And then you got people talking about the duration of how long it's happened, sometimes twice a month, right? Once daily, it occurs like it's been over for a year and a half. I've definitely heard the booms, you know, where they are when they hear it, the first time they hear it, the second time they hear it, like both times happen around 3.53 p.m. I'm mean, sorry, a.m. Yeah. I tried to record it, but it went quiet. So people are actually paying attention to this and really looking for it, right? And then they're talking about, like, evidence that you should find for something that's creating this loud boom effect. Like, if it was a transformer explosion, there should be evidence of it somewhere. Hmm. And people are even saying, okay, so the electric company is having problems, and it's basically transform blowing. And somebody's like, well, no, it's the gas company having problems because something's blowing. And people are like, well, wait a minute, then something that big should leave a burn mark somewhere. Right? Yeah. I didn't see anything since I'm an apartment dweller, but this one morning it shook our building and set off some car alarms. We live right next to Del Norte. My husband said, he said he's heard it many times before. And then people say, it's not a transformer. It's not fireworks. There's too many reports of that sort of thing. The other day, my house was shaking. I can say 100% without a doubt it shakes me every single time it occurs. So please call and report it. Which if you have that person's address, you're getting close to what's going on. Yeah. So this is not necessarily a localized phenomenon, but it is a local phenomenon. And if you keep reading the thread, as I did, right, people asking for the footage, confirming that they're hearing more noise, so it's more and more and more. We're having the same booms in Roswell. We're having the same booms in Den- Deming. Right. Here's an official statement from a company that I didn't think would have anything to do with this at first. And that company would have been... Um, Industrial di- IDM, industrial manufacturer, industrial diamond manufacturer, uh, the Playas Training and Research Center, and things like that. And I'm right. like, hmm. It's, and then one dude just flat out just drops the directed energy link. <laughs> yeah. But see, the funny thing is that if we're hearing these booms and are yeah. accompanied by the whooshing noise and stuff like that, later on in the thread, in the comment thread, they start talking about like the hypersonic rail testing and things like that. Yeah. And being able to launch hypersonic weapons or being able to launch something. They're testing something using hypersonic rails, as in like train rails, like some kind of rail assembly to be able to test the hypersonic, whatever it may be. And then you've got the same booms happening in Roswell, same booms happening in Deming, same booms happening in Albuquerque or somewhere in around Albuquerque, right? What if this is basically all connected? Wouldn't it be cool to be able to take some like something you need and be able to transfer it from like, say, Roswell to Deming? Yeah. In like two minutes or a minute versus like three hours of yeah. drive time. And considering the Air Force Research Laboratory Directed Energy Directorate at the Department of Air Force Center of Expertise in Kirkland Air Force Base, New Mexico. Mm. And Kirkland is what, how far? Uh, seven minutes away from where they're talking about roughly? Maybe a little bit longer? Yes. And it's a moving trailer with the directed energy testing on top of it. Huh. And if I look at this pick really hard, because I know the Sandia Mountains, this is po- pointing straight south. Yeah. Towards Deming. Yep. <laughs> Actually, it, it's technically pointing southwest. So pretty much they're talking about this stuff, you know, and what is it? Is it a contactor switching inside like a thunderclap type noise? No, it's not it. But as they go through and they sort of list it all out and they start doing their own research and they're very, basically verifying and fact-checking and they bring up the hypersonic testing, right? And I start to think about it. I'm like, okay, well, I remember the Navy testing like rail guns and things like that. And they were possibly even going to put one on a ship. Like the Zoomwalk class was going to get an electric rail gun. It should be able to launch, you know, basically hypersonic rounds you know, thousands of miles away to shoot using electricity is going to be a big thing. Yeah. And so when I looked at it to, to try to see if it even relates at all to what these people on Reddit are talking about, I come across the, the part of the article that I thought was pretty interesting where it basically says that the Navy is done with that. They're not doing that. <laughs> they spent all this money, right? I think it's like $550 million to do some of the research to figure out if they want to use these rail guns. They were going to put it on a ship, and now all of a sudden they're not. They, they've sort of stepped away from it, and they're going to use a different type of hypersonic weapon. Hmm. All right? Yeah. So what they're actually going to do is they're going to use, like, um, hypersonic weapons fired from more traditional 
ordnance, like five inch guns or something like that that are on a ship, right? So they ditched the futuristic rail gun and they're going to, I, you know, use hypersonic missiles instead. Now, it doesn't make sense to me for them to do all that stuff. And the, the funny thing is that the, the timing of the article is like, the article says that the Navy is going to ditch the futuristic rail gun, which is what I think is actually happening in Albuquerque and other places, mm-hmm. is rail gun testing. Uh, they said they were going to do that like way before uh, these this Reddit thread and the people talking about it. In other words, we're not going to use rail guns, mm-hmm. but the reports are still coming in. It's still happening. I just wanted to note, um, Kirtland Air Force Base is 242 miles away from Deming. And if we do as the crow flies, you will pass over the tip of White Sands Missile Range. Yeah. So, listeners, I do want to remind you guys, New Mexico is a huge state. It's like, what, the fifth or sixth biggest state? Yeah, it's very large, and there's a whole lot less people there. Yeah. Yeah. Than other states of equal size. Yeah, it is. Because it's a lot of desert. It's like fifth or sixth in size, but 37th. 35th, whatever it was. Last time we checked in population density. So there's plenty of room to execute rail gun testing or directed energy testing. So if the Navy is going to ditch the rail gun in in use of hypersonic missiles instead, it doesn't make sense. You know what does make sense? They've got the technology figured out. Right, and they're going to be useful to use, and so they're now. Let's just get this out of the public eye. They even went so far as to put the range, like, oh, we've only been able to shoot our railgun 110 miles, and I, just which is still longer than like if you shot a conventional weapon, right on a on a ship. That's still further than what the average Chinese or Russian ship can do. Yeah, but well short of the thousand mile range that they were kind of looking for. So let's go ahead and pull this railgun thing out of the public eye because we know it's going to work. We're going to use it. Let's polish it up and let's do our tactics around it and get all of our military, you know, secret stuff of how we're going to implement this weapon. Let's pull it out and just get it out of the public eye. You know what I mean? Because here's the scoop. When it comes to this sort of thing and trying to keep a lot of this stuff secret, it's really hard to do. Because people have cameras, they have cell phones, they've been seeing more things than ever. It's on these popular shows. And, you know, you can find out about the SR-71 Blackbird. It took 30, 40 years for people to even know that thing existed. But then you've got shows that come on Sundays where they're telling you every single thing about it. It's like the the amount of time it takes from uh, being fully aware that this, you know, piece of technology exists down to a television show to tell you what it's made out of doesn't seem to take very long at all. In other words, once the cat's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. Yeah. So why not get the public used to, let's let half the cat out of the bag. So you know there's a cat in the bag, but you don't know the entire you know, makeup of the cat, right? You, know, you don't know how big the cat is. You don't really know, but you know it exists. Yeah. And you just pull it back. And people aren't going to be like, oh, my God, there it is, because they've already been exposed to it. Mm-hmm. If you've already been exposed to it, you're less likely to pay attention to it because this happens so quick where something pops up, flashes, becomes super popular for about two seconds, disappears, nobody cares. Right? And when you say, hey, did you hear about it? Yeah, that's old news, man. And you just move on. Nobody cares anymore. What if they're doing that with this whole thing, this whole military technology thing? Yeah. Because why would you get rid of rail guns? Rail guns are super cool. I know. With rail gun, I think your rounds would be less expensive, you know, because you're basically using electricity and you're magnetically launching this thing. And I read a book. In the 80s, I think it was like 83 maybe, is Remo Williams, where they built a rail gun, and this, this evil villain guy built a rail gun that could launch anything he wanted, like heavy metal stuff. So what he did was he like launched a locomotive at a, at a part of the country. He's like a 1,000 miles away. This guy launched a locomotive. Can you imagine a steam engine falling out of the sky? It doesn't have to have any explosive stuff, and the kinetic impact alone would destroy whatever it hits up to like 700-mile range. Yeah. Crazy. So if the technology is being or has been seen, it's been slightly introduced, right, or exposed, but then they start to pull it back, I don't think it's because they're getting rid of it. You don't throw away $550 million just to get rid of it. I think you pull it back because you, you, got, it, you got it done. Let's go ahead and put a patent on it, right? Let's get ready because it's not necessarily the government that's doing this. I think that most of the stuff that's happening is done the way it's been done with skunk works and things like that. It's companies that are basically been contracted to do, do the work for the government. And those companies, 
you know, get the benefit of all the patents and everything involved when it becomes public knowledge. And they can start using that technology to, you know, get the reward of actually having created it in the first place. You created it for the government, but that doesn't mean that you can't necessarily use some of your advancements to private your own company yeah. or profit your own company to a, a much higher standing, which I think is what's actually starting to happen here. Because hmm. I think that the military is not drawing down at all. I think it's actually ramping up. We're having a lot more sightings with different things. You got railgun technology. Um, <laughs> you've got, oh, listen, we're going to not use railguns anymore. We're just going to use hypersonic missiles <laughs> like China and North Korea and Soviet Union. Hypersonic missiles probably a little bit more expensive than launching a, a kinetic weapon. Yeah. So some of this stuff doesn't make sense, right? And then let's talk about Area 51. Area 51 has a large bunker now. I'm sorry, not bunker, hangar. Yeah. Remember a couple of years ago, we talked about Area 51 and the idea that drones and swarm, basically using drones in swarms controlled by a ship like a mothership is a thing. And that some of the footage that was coming out of people saying that they seen this at Area 51 was exactly that, testing that sort of drone swarm technology sort of idea. And then we tried to correlate that with some of the weird drone situations going on in Southern Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. As being part of it. Yeah. Like autonomous drones controlled by a mothership sort of thing. And then it's like, if we talked about it for a while, it sort of went away and we didn't care anymore. Because mm-hmm. that's what we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what we all do these days in society is kind of move yeah. along and find something new. To look. Well, guess what? If the drone thing is true, and I don't know why it wouldn't be, because you've got like able wing man and other types of technology being sold to other countries. Um, who's to say that Area 51 has sort of switched over to a training facility slash drone training facility. And they've been doing this for a long time. And a lot of what you see out of there is autonomous aircraft. They built a big giant hangar. And from what you could see with the link we actually provided, it looks like the drones come in, they get serviced and they launch all from this huge hangar. So they could basically fly out and fly in and you wouldn't even hardly see them. They don't have to land yeah. on the ground. They just fly in because they're small. And if the mothership is is a is, is a drone, but it's like pretty large, like maybe as big as like a a stealth craft, like a one seventeen A or something like that. I mean, you could put a lot of drones on it, or if you make your own, you could put a thousand little drones on there hmm. and have it do whatever mission you need to do. You know, yeah. So that's the thing. There's pictures of this new hangar facility that points to a drone swarm future. Oh wow! He even got pictures of it being built. So February yeah. 2020, July 2020, September 2020, and then the most updated ones. So I don't think they're housing alien craft anymore. I think they are continue to house and are polishing up on technology, right, mm-hmm. that we currently make, yeah. whether it was an alien influence or not. It used to be they they launched the jets out there and want to keep them super top secret, right? Nobody knew our spy stuff. Everybody knows about drones. I think they're just hiding it as best they can, but it's not like mission critical to hide every single aspect about a drone. Hmm. And what makes sense? You've got drones that have been pestering ships, right? And doing all this drone attacks and stuff on, you know, simulated attacks all over the place. And every country's had instances of being swarmed by drones. Hmm. I think every country has drones. So let's take these drones and let's put the military technology from the Navy that's been patented already and maybe put the technology we already have in these drones. They can fly any way they want. They look like they're completely otherworldly. They don't, they don't have to respond to gravity and things like that. Okay. Or inertial force. Because there's nobody flying them. There's no physical par- person in there. Okay. They can dip in the water to possibly cool off and fly back up again. I mean, you know, who knows, right? So I think a lot of this fantastical stuff that we're seeing is actually military. And if you go by the old adage that, you know, if you see it now, the military has advanced it 30, 40 years in the future. Yeah. I think that number is even bigger. I don't know. They went from biplanes. Yeah. To launching rockets in like the span of 40 years. Yeah, but I I don't think that just uh, is exclusive to military in general. I think every advancement made so far seems to be like these huge leaps and bounds. Yeah, and um, most of it was driven by war, right? Okay. And the Cold War okay. and getting to space. That's where you got your tang from and your uh, hook and loop fastener, otherwise known as Velcro. <laughs> right? I'm serious. 
fluorescent paint and colors using the day glow colors, reflective things, all that sort of thing. Anechoic radar, t- you know, coatings, mm-hmm. anechoic tiles, all this stuff, aerogel. Mm-hmm. Who knows, right? I just think we're way ahead of where we think. I hope that's really what it is. I really hope we are. If we're not, we're so screwed. We don't have a chance at all. And all these movies we ever watch about, you know, the aliens coming down, trying to be nice. I don't think that's the case. The ones where they're coming down and just going to take over stuff. I think that's even better. Um, uh, better as in a realistic representation of what's going to happen. We would like to think they're nice. I don't know. I'm just saying. A, a friend of the podcast was recently talking about an article about how, um, whereas like in the 90s, early 90s, uh, manufacturing was taken away out of, outside of America or outside of the United States. Yeah. And now it's getting to the point where research and development doesn't truly pay. So now research and development is being taken outside of the United States. And more of this research and development is either being done independently by crazy Elon Musk types or it's being done by other countries. Yeah. And I, I tried to argue. I was like, well, maybe... There's still research and development and advancement going on in the United States. It's just under such closed wraps. And that friend of the podcast fought me hard on it because they were looking at it from more of a uh, societal level. Like, well, those research and advancements should be, you know, more applicable to the general American citizen all around. And I'm like, nope. We're putting all our eggs more into, like, the military technology basket. Uh, maybe, you know, <clears throat> it was just, it de- It really sort of depends on which conspiracy theory you want to jump on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, if you look at like, well, you know, Hey, big pharma runs everything. I mean, it just becomes a thing, but I don't know. It just seems like a lot of this stuff is sort of starting to connect like deep underground military bases. There were bases that were shut down that are now reactivated and seem to be expanding. Yes. Which would make sense because if that happened during uh, our previous president's regime, which would make sense because, you know, doing things like creating a space force, which doesn't say, hey, we're there, like, you know, to explore. It's like, no, we're there to protect our interest in space. I don't think that was created just because they wanted to. Mm-hmm. That's a need. Okay. Because if you look at some of the things that are going on in space right now, I mean, you've got countries blowing up satellites mm-hmm. to test their – shoot them out of the sky capability, which just happens to coincide with the launch of other satellites, like maybe to keep, you know, some areas that, uh, you know. And then alleged satellite crashes being blamed on. Sunspots. Sunspots or unanticipated asteroids. Yeah, yeah. And then we're finding out there's an asteroid that's been silently following us. And I'm like, I mean, and and the news article was like, there's an asteroid that's been stalking Earth. And I'm like, that's just creepy. Yeah, and that asteroid doesn't know. He's just hanging out. <laughs> like, I think it's thing. And, and and there's also, like, the, you, know, you hear the rumors of every satellite that's up in space has a shadow. Like a redundancy? No, like a, a bad guy shadow right next to it. To where if something happens, if, what's the best way to get rid of a satellite? It's not to shoot it down. From the ground. That's clumsy. Mm-hmm. How about you just launch a little satellite whose goal it is is to sit there and hang out next to that particular satellite. And if you need to, you float that satellite over to the satellite you don't want and blow the satellite up. It's like mm-hmm. James Bond stuff. Okay. Which is easier because, you know, hey, you can launch, quote unquote, communication satellites all day long. And it wouldn't take much to blow a hole in a satellite. I mean, because you hear about it on the news all the time. Uh, a speck of dust the size of a marble, you know, traveling at 14 thousand miles an hour will blow a hole right through anything, right? Yeah, but then, like, my... Micrometeorites. Ima- my imagination is heading towards, like, <clears throat> like, every country having a Skynet. And it's just this Skynet on top of Skynet on top of Sky, like these layers of these independent, allegedly independent satellites. Well, it wouldn't take every country. It would be some of the most advanced countries well, yeah. that could do okay, it. Okay, so the powerhouses is what no, I'm no, I, no, you're missing what I'm saying. I'm not trying to dis. I'm, what I'm saying is, yeah. it wouldn't take much. Yeah. You know, you only need three or four countries to launch a couple satellites. But like then, communication satellites that secretly break apart and release these spheres that go find their partner satellites and sit there like a shadow. Or, and here's where my, I've been reading too many first contact 
alien interaction books on Kindle lately. What if they are actually in partnership and we do have this giant blanket of satellites keeping an eye on something that we don't know? Because I'm going to go right back towards, yes, you're thinking military technology. I'm thinking, what if we're all arguing and we're all launching because we all know or somebody knows an something's, imminent threat something's coming. That unites mankind. Yes. Like that stalker hmm. asteroid is getting a little too stalkery and might have... Well, I mean, that would be great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Guaranteed that's probably not what's happening. Unfortunately. Now, you know, that's not to say that they could be used. Like, maybe that's what Starlink is. Maybe Starlink and the satellite shield that's going to be created will get together or like Men in Black style and create like an electromagnetic or some kind of like space force field to keep crap from coming and get us like aliens and stalker asteroids. Yeah. Which is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's a possibility. But I kind of think that space force was created because of these things that are in orbit that we don't really know or can put a, a definite task to, like what's the task of this particular satellite. And I think it's put up there because there's so many of these things that you can, it's hard to track with like one or two. I think you got to have a complete agency devoted to tracking that kind of thing and furthering other interests. And because it's a military, it's not like, hey, let's go out like this Federation from Star Trek. It's not like that. Mm-hmm. They're there to protect the U.S.'s interest in space. But, you know, Starlink, Space Force, created roughly around the same time when it comes to launching satellites. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Which is funny because that sort of thing, you know, it, at what point do you start becoming, getting listened to and spied upon as a podcast for saying stuff like that? <laughs> I don't know if we're there yet. we got a little something for you coming up. But we do want to talk about earthquakes because this is something that's sort of weird, right? We talked about, you know, the hypersonic stuff. There are loud booms that have been occurring all over the the planet, that's not a big deal anymore because we hear and we don't know what they are. Earthquakes occur all over the world all at the same time or different times, different varying intensities and seismic levels and that sort of thing. But we have happened to notice that there's some around here. Yeah. Where we live as we broadcast stuff from our underground bunker location. Deep in the mountains of western North Carolina. Don't tell them where we... So what do you think about these earthquakes? You should tell people. Just to put it, could put it in reference, uh, in the past year, we've had over 85 earthquakes. Yeah. Most of which occurring at the last half of the year. There was like eight, and then all of a sudden 300 and something. Yes. So with, well, I'm sorry, no, eight and then like 80 something? Within the um, Western North Carolina and South Carolina region, there's been a total of 83 earthquakes in the past 365 days. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. However, um, in December, there was like a huge spike. I don't, I can't find the number. Was it like 21 or something? I don't. Uh, it was. It depended yeah. because it was like thirty something at one place. So it really sort of depend where you got your information from. Yeah, and at what level they were calling it or classifying as earthquake. Because some of the uh, places I looked didn't classify it as being seismically worthy until it hit like one point seven on the Richter scale. Yeah, and like if you look at this map that we've as on one of the links we provide in the show notes, it really does go along the spine of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Now. This hasn't really been talked about short of a couple of local news stations for Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, South Carolina. Um, We get the upper South Carolina channels for some reason. Because of the mountains. Yeah. And South Carolina, a couple of news entities have tried to investigate, and they were like, look, we've had like, it was like four earthquakes in a week, ranging from something as small as like 1.7 or 1.3 all the way up to like 2.5 in magnitude. Yeah. Um, and some of the 2.5 and higher ones, they were in places like Marshall, North Carolina, um, Dandridge, Tennessee. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, repeatedly, Dandridge, Tennessee just showed up on this map. Like 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, but yeah, it's like this this very specific map. Now, um WLS has a news reporter as well as some news reporters in South Carolina, but I follow one for um, WLOS, and he said that some news entities and independent journalists reached out, and the answer they got was uh, speculative mining, which is essentially pros- prospecting companies. Yeah, were doing high-powered mining through the Blue Ridge Mountains. You know what I think it is? And that was the only information they were given. Yep. 
He asked what they were mining for, and they said, we don't have that answer. We're speculative. Yeah. I think they're expanding deep underground military bases. Which we've heard that in the past. And I've been really, really skeptical about that because it's Western North Carolina. It's the mountains. However, that's the best place to be. What's changing my mind about that is the fact that we've been talking about these high energy, um, these high energy weapons and basically hypersonic. And the technology has like that, that effect similar to an earthquake. Yes. What do you, um, God, I'm, it's late. I mean, it depends <laughs> how they're drilling it, but yeah. it, it, it basically is. The rec- re- uh, percussive yeah yes and these earthquakes we're on a fault line here yeah it's one of the largest in the uh, uh in north america yeah it we're on one of the largest fault lines in north america to counter that in new mexico you have the continental divide fault line yeah and there there was reports of testing relatively near those locations yeah i mean well if you look at it seismically speaking the u.s is generally pretty stable yeah compared to somewhere like japan or unfortunately california but you know a large chunk of the u.s is is pretty stable now if we are Um, on a fault line and we are on some sort of shelf off the you know that basically dangles off the atlantic ocean then maybe i might understand these weird earthquakes a little better i mean i don't know you know because you know, hey, the U.S. has earthquakes all the time. We have them here. We've had them in the past. I mean, it's it's a thing that occurs naturally. But the frequency of some of these earthquakes is not natural. Or at least I don't think so. Yeah. But, I mean, you look at the number, like, oh, since like 1930 we've had so many earthquakes. Well, when you have like a majority of them occur in one year. Yeah. And they're not showing the same sort of after effects that would maybe occur from uh, naturally occurring earthquakes slash leading up to a larger seismic event. I don't know. I think this part of it is they're basically expanding these deep underground military bases. And when I started taking a deeper, you know, a little bit of a deeper look, I kind of found something I thought was pretty interesting, right? It's an article called the subterranean battlefield, right? Warfare is going underground into dark tight places, uh, places. I was going to say spaces, <laughs> Now this and this article is not a new article. They so they've been doing this for a minute. Yeah. And so hey, if you've got a bunch of deep underground military bases, you probably should learn how to defend and fight with those things, right? Okay. Or to fight in the area. So what if everything, you know, and this is a, a, for a podcast at a later time, talking about hollow earth and fighting stuff and you know the the space alien under the military space alien battleground fight that happened underground in Deming somewhere. You mean Dulce? Yeah, Dulce. Yeah, what did I say? Deming. I meant Dulce. Yeah. And the deep underground military base there. Deming has its own weird that I think I should do a podcast episode on. So, yeah. Or no. I mean, you? What, you just want me to sit here and chew gum or well, what's it's, up? It's rock related. So. Okay, well, look. Here's the deal, <laughs> rock nerd. You can throw it out there. But, I mean, yeah, that's a podcast all into itself uh, for sure. I mean, is it correlative? Is, is all this, I mean, all of this is really sort of speculative, but when you start looking at different things, and it's just like I said with the purple cars 47 minutes ago, <laughs> right? Once you start to see them, you start to see them, and they become either more interesting or more commonplace, and you just don't worry about it too much. But I think there's a lot of technology that the government has that's been out there that's being, of course, misidentified, right? And just lumped in with the whole, like, yeah, we don't know what that is. And it sort of takes the heat off of it so that one day when you do see like the legendary Aurora spacecraft, which is probably out of service now, come blowing through the atmosphere doing sonic booms, you're like, oh yeah, that's huh. what that is. And if you watch some of the shows where you see weird random space debris coming in all crazy and like, what is that? Well, it could be space debris. People are like, well, it's, you know, it's not really a meteor falling through the sky. It's, you know, more control. Well, maybe it's a craft. And maybe we've had a space force for a long time and now we just need to make it official. So when the space force goes, hey guys, check out our sweet new plane. It's already been in existence. Because hmm. we've talked about like the, was it X-37B, I think? Because it's like, space small scale shuttle thing that was in the sky for having the longest record autonomous flight or something like that or like a year i can't remember it was been a while but it was in the it was in the news what does it do don't know yeah because it's a secret 
or the weird stuff I saw right before we left New Mexico, like hovering and then eventually landing at that private airport outside yep. of Albuquerque. Is that the one that MUFON said, oh, that's just trash? Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah. and then Reddit ripped apart uh, yeah. Albuquerque's MUFON. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, that's just trash. You yeah. sure it looks like a trash can hovering in the sky. Which made me feel so good because that was like, that was my first experience with Reddit, like, redeeming me, you know, making me yeah. feel good about myself. <laughs> Usually, you on Reddit, you have experts that are telling people that have applied things in practical application and have intimate hands-on knowledge that they're morons. <laughs> and these experts are just rocking that computer chair. Like, hmm, let me Let me scoot in here. Let me get close and get all the bins so I can start turbo pecking away, right? It's like, how can you tell me? That the, like in my, in, in, anyway, the van that we have with the bed in it, you can't tell me that it doesn't work. We've been using it for a couple of years. Oh, that just, that won't work. What? Of course it works. We're, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, from my keyboard research, I'm here to tell you that's not feasible. Okay. Well, I raise you two, two, what, two weeks worth of clothes and some winter coats that says that the space we have built into our bed works just fine. But outside of that, this is, this has been a very redeeming episode towards the social media platform of Reddit. So. Yeah, because I, you know, and that thread for the comments goes, it, it's pretty deep and it goes in there. But yeah, I, I was impressed. Yeah. yeah, I was impressed. And, and you kind of have to put it in context. A lot of people don't, I don't think, realize um, to the extent of how weird New Mexico is. Yeah. I mean, think about it. New Mexico is pretty crazy. But we, you know. we dropped atomic bombs on New Mexico. Like a bunch of them. And people stayed living yeah, there. they shrugged it off and kept growing, you know. And I know that sounds, but it's true, though. It's like, and you know, if you really want to, you can go to White Sands, and you can go stand on the spot where they dropped atomic bombs. Yep. Yeah. And they'll, they'll let you on there. even give you some ice water if you want. <laughs> I'm serious. They do. It's true. I mean, all right, we went on, at the Trinity site. Yes. What did they have there? Ambulance to be safe. Or a potty to use a restroom, ice water if you were thirsty, mm-hmm. little trams to take you uh, down so you didn't have to walk. It was pet friendly. And it was the nicest, nicest atomic site I've ever been on. And probably, is it your only? Yes. Well, yeah. But guess how much it cost? It cost exactly zero, and they were pretty nice about it. Yeah. They even had an amnesty trash can for all the potheads and weirdos. It just basically said, get rid of it. Yeah. And I threw a coffee can in it. And you could even cup. pick up glass created from the nuclear insp- explosion. Yeah, but you can't take it with you. That's a, that's a crime. But I you know. could play with it. It's called Trinonite. Yeah, which made me so mad because yeah. I would. Well, people used to steal it. Let me take this piece of radioactive glass. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not going to melt your face off or anything, but still, it's uh, something. To... But yeah, they usually do that in the first week of uh, first weekend in April and, and October. October, yeah. Cuz the you know, original testing date is in July and it's like a thousand degrees there hot. Yeah. And then when they would do that sort of thing, people would fall out. So they shifted the time where you could actually come visit to two times a year and in the you know, mildest time. But they haven't done it because of COVID. Uh I think the past 2 years, so. Oh, I think they resumed this year in October. I don't know. But they hadn't done the April one, so yeah. Yeah, okay. I yeah. think yeah. who knows, man. It's weird. You kinda kinda play it by ear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and you know, the funny thing was about that, just kinda we stood there in line waiting to be checked in because you know it's a military it's a mil- it's a missile testing range. Right? It's a it's a for real military base. There's no joking around with it. I talked to a guy who drove from Texas. Yeah. Ex military. Who just got out. He's like sergeant or something like that. And he was all like, Why are you here? I'm like, Well, I'm here because I'm here to check it out. And I said, You're coming at me all wrong, bro. And then we talked a little bit. Okay. And once he said, well, I just got out of the military. And he, he just got out. I think he was a sergeant major or staff sergeant or something like that. He had just got out like a month. Like, oh, you still got that military bearing stink all over you. <laughs> Give it a minute. It'll wash off. But no, he wanted to know. Um, yeah, so it was a good time. Now, we do have one part of the podcast that we're not going to talk about until next time. What? What are you looking like that for? Which part? Am I skipping something? Huh? This is where you talk. What are you pointing at? I cannot see what you're pointing at. Yeah, but since we both share a Google document that goes over our podcast notes, it's the one that I highlighted. So Yeah, but I was going to share that for next time. Actually, I wasn't. I guess we could. If it's in the title, let's go ahead and talk about okay, it. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Cause Tell them what it is. 
this the, the, hold on the part I was going to talk about mm-hmm. we, we we're not going to talk about it until next time because it has audio visual thing attached to it and it'll make the podcast like an hour and 30 minutes long and I think that's just too long it's fine <laughs> yeah it's okay it's no let's let's give them what they pay for <laughs> if they're even still here and you know, people chew, typically tune out after about an hour okay. or so but yeah you're right I, I totally almost missed this part and you are absolutely correct in talking about it because this kind of ties into what we've been talking about as well and it does it's been sitting in the back of my head for this entire episode and this is from psychology today and Basically, it states, are paranormal beliefs a result of lazy thinking? Now, the amount of work Greg has put into this podcast episode certainly doesn't say that he's lazy at all. <laughs> I was going to say, ancient alien theorists disagree, <laughs> right? <laughs> However, you were talking earlier about uh, the silver strands that connect everything. And the first thing I thought of when you said that was uh, apophania which is um, what pareidolia is classified under. It basically means finding connections that are not apparent or unmotivated seeing of connections. So have I am you, certainly unmotivated at seeing. <laughs> so have you cohesively made all the connections you could in this episode? Oh, I can go on for hours. Okay, in a cohesive manner. Well, the cohesive manner part's the hard part. Okay. You wind up turning into Charlie from, you know, Sunny in Pennsylvania. What is that show? Mm-hmm. Sunny in Philadelphia. What is it? Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, where he's doing the crazy madman thing. Yeah. Um, he, he, <laughs> there's so much information out there that you could literally, this is the rabbit hole that people spend 30 years connecting the dots. And there are people that are way more eloquent with the entire thing, like um, uh, Richard Dolan. Yeah. You know. Who and even Michio Kaku to a certain degree, they do a much better job. And then you've got uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who still has to toe the line, true, and puts the public face on science. But I think if you got him a couple drinks on him, he'd probably start telling you some crazy stuff he really believes in. And I'm going to completely discount Bill Nye the Science Guy because you know, yeah, yeah. However, this article from Psychology Today would argue against those scientific minds you just mentioned. Yes. It's trying to state that a new study suggests a correlation observed in the West is culturally culturally mediated. Previous studies have shown that lower cognitive reflection scores correlate with higher paranormal belief, but have focused on Westerners. A new cross-cultural study reinforced the existence of this correlation among Westerners, but did not find it among the Japanese. This suggests that the influence of analytical thinking on paranormal belief may not be direct, but instead mediated by cultural norms. Right. In a nutshell, I take those three key points as saying uh, we failed to recognize that Eastern culture, Japanese, Asian cultures, who have paranormal and um, spiritualistic. Yeah. It's ingrained not just on a spiritual level, but in a cultural level. Uh, anime and like you know sci-fi and things like that were so readily readily absorbed by Japanese culture, especially after the end of World War II. It became ingrained in society. However, we all, all Americans and all Europeans, we have a very high opinion of the median intelligence of Japanese culture. Yeah. So how can these very smart people or group of so this very smart society of people still believe in things like ghosts and and spirits and the paranormal? This whole article doesn't really answer that. Yeah, because they can't because that's the whole thing. These, yeah. It's part of these people's culture, right? It's part of growing up. It's part of the whole physiological makeup that makes them who they are. And now... Within the past 30 years, there has been a significant influx in paranormal, UFO, and sci-fi type um, media ingested by the past two or three generations. Yes. So now we have all of Gen Z or Xennials or whoever, they readily accept the paranormal and they readily accept beliefs that used to be considered outlandish in like the 1970s. Yeah. Well, see, it's funny because you, you see the things that you'd see on TV, 
where they'd interview somebody and they're like, this person is obviously a wacko Mm -hmm. and put them on TV saying, I seen a UFO. They don't necessarily do that in like Japan because that's, that's just part of how it is. Mm -hmm. So it's readily accepted. So there's no reason to make fun of it or discount somebody or discredit somebody. It goes back to what we were saying before, uh, where people will say, as I sit in my office in New York, that the person in West Virginia who basically said, I seen this floating 10 foot tall, right? apron having alien flying around you know like the flatwoods monster oh they didn't really see that at all what they actually seen was a bird (laughs) or something that's non-related because you know hey that person living in that particular area is probably not smart enough right or modern enough to know the difference between a bird versus an alien even though they've lived there their entire lives and they're fully aware of what's in their environment and when you talked about the cognitive reflection test yeah. That test is designed to measure a person's ability, right, to respond to a problem by rejecting the first incorrect answer that springs to mind and then engaging their analytic reasoning skills to find the less obvious but correct solution. In other words, looking past what's obvious and finding a better, more correct solution. That's what it says. And what does Occam's razor say? The most obvious explanation is probably the answer. Yeah. They're saying that they're going to basically take what's put out there. Oh, the answer is aliens instead of going, let's take this a step further. Is it really a, is it really an alien beast wearing a skirt or something 10, 12 feet tall flying around in West Virginia? Or is it something else like a bird? <laughs> that doesn't, and this cognitive reflection test doesn't work as you were explaining and how the whole thing came about. It doesn't work in a country where the belief in things like that, the metaphysical, the spiritual, the, mm-hmm. the basically the paranormal, right? With, you know, spirits and ghosts and gods and demons and dragons and whatever else you want to tie to it. Yeah. It's part of their makeup. They believe in it just as good as they believe that the day is, you know, governed by the sky, right? Yeah. Or that sunlight is sunlight and moonlight is moonlight. It's all part of it. So that does, this cognitive reflection test doesn't take into account that. And that's what this article is about. Yeah. Saying, well, you know what, guys? Maybe... Maybe there's something to it. So it's not all science. And if you believe in anything other than your whack job, because there's a whole group of scientists now and who I, have come out and said, you know what? Scientifically speaking, this is science, but I believe in God too. I feel though that this is an elitist article in this, and very derisive of culture because they are putting, yes, they are putting a certain culture on a pedestal because that culture I don't know their reasoning, but is it because that culture is not dumb Americans? Well, no, it goes even further because it basically suggests that analytic thought does not reinforce beliefs that are at odds with the naturalistic worldview, and thus that analytic individuals have decreased levels of supernatural belief. But we have. And they're saying they they said that and the exact opposite in the same article. And we have independent cultures within the Americas. Very strong independent cultures. We have Appalachian culture. We have indigenous culture. We have uh, Mexican American cultures. The European culture and and Celtic cultures. All of those different cultures that are are somewhat insular, but they are very steadfast in their beliefs. They all have their own paranormal or mythic folklore that they stay true to. Yeah. However. We have, through the histories of Americas, we have been derisive of all those cultures, ranging from, unfortunately, indigenous to now these days, it's the Appalachian hillbilly culture. Right. We we have been derisive of them and considered them of lower standing. And when she says we, she doesn't mean us. Oh, it's a creepy spot. Yes, I mean, society in general. That's just to do scientists. So that's dirty. Yeah. yeah. I'm, so, I'm trying to put on my anthropological hat here. So... I think not giving credit to certain cultures and groups of people in the Americas uh, with focus right now, in in my opinion, Appalachia and the rich folklore history and paranormal that is a part of people's lives. It's just being, they're still finding a way to be dismissive. Well, they're trying to, but they're also trying to acknowledge that maybe they're slightly off in their So in case there's one smart Appalachian in That's what this entire article is because yeah. it basically says um, they've conducted... Right. Several studies to measure cognitive reflection and paranormal belief in both English speaking North American and European and Japanese to which we go back to what you were saying before. Yeah. And the results 
uh, for their English speaking subjects were similar. <laughs> right. But here's what it basically boiled down to. It says basically it's similar, that, but we don't want to acknowledge yeah, it. The CRT yeah. scores in paranormal beliefs among Japanese subjects were compared and there was no correlation found. So if you grew up with it, right? Yeah. Okay. Then that by growing up with it, it didn't change. They didn't get the results they were looking for. Yeah. It's really what it boiled down to. It's like, hmm, so if the CRT test is not going to do it, then what is it? And they're saying that if you grow up with it and you basically look at science and that sort of thing, you can basically take take both and make them work together. In other words, if you grew up with it, you're not a moron if you believe in ghosts and science. But they were saying that, okay, one doesn't, doesn't fit the other. Mm-hmm. If you're a science guy, you can't really believe in ghosts or whatever. You're an idiot if you do. This sounds- if you're an idiot, you can't believe in science stuff because you're an idiot. But this thing says, well, wait a minute, what about countries that are like Japan where it's ingrained in them? Their results are even more valid because it's not a factor. So they're saying that your CRT tests were wrong. This sounds like the same argument that was used in the early 2000s against like scientists that were atheists versus scientists that believed in, had, had a religious. Exactly. Yeah, had a religion. How can you be a science guy and believe in God? Yeah. You know, it's like, um, you know, you, you got to be agnostic or something. Yeah. You, know, you can't just, and what they're finding out with this thing here is that, oh, well, if you grew up that way, then you can, you know, make it work. And if you didn't, then you're not an idiot. It's kind of like backpedaling. Yeah. But it's more like a backhanded compliment. And I, I just, I have to laugh because this is from psychology today, which is basically the study of psychology in itself attempted to standardize and relay sets of principles on something so so strange, which is the human mind. How are you going to black and white the human mind? And now you're trying to black and white people's identity and capacity as a human being by their beliefs or lack of beliefs. Yeah. So. And the funny thing is, is that we may not be smart enough to actually be reading this article correctly. <laughs> But when I read it, I'm like, okay, so before, <laughs> if you believed in UFOs, you were obviously not intelligent enough, hey, um, right? So you were like on a, you, you weren't going to score well on this cognitive recognition test because you're not going to go for the most correct answer. You're trying to go for the obvious answer, right? On paper. And then they'd be like, oh, well, hold on now. Maybe we were a little off with that. And, and, and why we were off from that is because, oh, well, you grew up with it, so it's okay. You're more likely to be accepting of both science and spiritualism or paranormal stuff because, you know, it's ingrained in you. It's in your culture. Yeah, just like the flower is alive versus the, you know, whatever, right? I'm like, okay. Okay, I got you. So, according to this article, it's okay. (laughs) I'm so glad I have Psychology Today's permission. Well, if you need to find a therapist, there's a link. (laughs) On the side, it basically says that, you know, because some of the articles that are on the side of this, which made me sort of look at this, go, okay, really, is like um, a striking link between vitamin D levels and Omicron. Mm. Um, Five ways our constant scrolling is messing with our minds. And stuff like that. Okay. So I don't know how... Psychology Today stacks when you compare to other fine newspapers and stuff or magazines or websites, but, you know, I don't know. I got to dump my Is this like the, you know, who knows? But anyway, it was just something that we should put in there. You're right. We should should talk about it. And that's not what I was going to skip over. What I'm going to skip over, um, it works better for next time because it takes a little bit because we're going to need your help. Yeah. To try to figure out what it is. You know, so, but at this point, I think we're, Probably just about done with Creepy Geeks podcast for yeah. this particular episode. So we don't really have any updates. We had BLTs for dinner. We usually mention what oh, we had yeah. for dinner. They were delicious. So we had giant BLTs, and so far we have no new news as far as any cryptids or weird creatures on our game cameras. But we'll check next time. Yeah, just the standard coyote fox. Guys, thanks for tuning in for so long. Um, appreciate everyone who tunes into the podcast if you like this podcast give us a rating on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on if you want to check us out or learn more creepgeeks.com or our patreon 
link in the show notes. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, pretty much all social media platforms. We are looking to make our Facebook group grow, so please check out Creep Geeks Facebook group. And it's literally called exactly that. Yes. Yes. All right, so there you go. Yep. Oh, and we have new stickers in the Craft Intent Etsy shop. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Very nice. All right, so anyway, there you go. See you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.